Ruthann sat up as if she had been jerked out of a dream. What Stucky Sabolsky wrote in their classroom. His ode to the rattler. Ned said he didn't get caught, so he must have written it somewhere he wasn't supposed to. I wonder if it's still there. Letty brushed a strand of sweaty hair off her face. After all these years, surely it would have been washed off, painted over, or just thrown away. Why don't we just set off firecrackers and go see Hattie Mae about some lemonade? Maybe he wrote it in an out-of-the-way place, Ruthann continued, or stashed a note somewhere, some place where his classmates might see it, but the teacher wouldn't. What if it's still there, I asked. Do you think it might tell us about who the rattler was or is? Only one way to find out, Ruthann answered, already skinnying down the rope ladder. Letty and I shrugged at each other and followed. Another one of life's universals is there's always one of those things in a town that everybody knows, except for the person who's new. So when we got to the high school and I asked Ruth Ann how she planned to get in, I wasn't surprised when she said, everybody knows the storage room window doesn't shut all the way. We skirted around the back of the building and Ruth Ann laced her fingers together to give me a leg up. Casting a, ne a last nervous glance over the schoolyard, I hoisted myself through the window. With an unexpected shove from below, I ended up tumbling into the storage room, overturning a galvanized bucket with a god-awful clamor. Lexi was next to, next to make her way through the window. She was much more graceful in her landing. Letty and I used the upturned bucket to stand on so we could reach out the window and grab hold of Ruth Ann. I'm surprised they don't fix that window, I said, now that we were all safe inside. Ruth Ann rubbed her stomach where she had scratched herself on the window sill. They would be Mr. Foster's the they would be Mr. Foster, the janitor, and he'd probably be delighted to spin a little web to catch some kids sneaking in. Letty nodded. My brothers say he can sniff out mischief and shenanigans before they can even happen. And when he's not chewing his tobacco, he loves to grab a kid by the scuff of the neck and march him to the principal's office. And before you know it, he's turned a little mischief into a cause for big trouble. Besides, Ruth Ann added, kids spend nine months of the year trying to get out of school. I guess they don't figure anyone's going to try to sneak back in. That made sense. And yet, here we were. Come on, Letty. Letty led the way out of the storage closet. The senior classroom is down the main floor. I didn't doubt that Letty, who had six older siblings, knew her way around this school. We tiptoed down the hall to the second classroom on the right. The heavy wooden door opened easily and we stepped in. There is an eerie, expectant feeling to a classroom in the summer. The normal classroom items were there, desks, chalkboards, a set of encyclopedias, the American flag with accompanying pictures of presidents, Washington and, Wils and Lincoln. But without students occupying those desks and their homework tacked on the wall, that empty summer classroom seemed laden with the memory of past students and past learning that took place within those walls. I strained to listen as if I might hear the whispering and stirrings of the past. Maybe Ruth Ann was right. Maybe there was more here than met the eye. We're not going to find anything just standing here, she said. We spied around, in the cloakroom, behind the teacher's desk, on the walls. Ruth Ann checked by the pencil sharpener and flipped through the dusty pages of a large dictionary atop a bookshelf. Too bad we can't just look it up. That would make things simple. It would have to be somewhere that wouldn't get painted over, Letty said, for some reason looking in the trash can. The room was still and the desk looked familiar and inviting. Ned's letter was fresh in my mind, so sitting in on one of the desks and running my hands over the grainy wooden top, I could imagine this room full of past students. Ned Gillen, Stucky Sabolsky, Danny McIntyre. Tracing my fingers along the ornate cast iron legs, I could picture Heck and Holler Carson, Pearl Ann Larkin, even Hattie Mae Harper. So where would Stucky have written his Ode to the Rattler? Letty interrupted my thoughts. Where would a teacher not look? I tapped my fingers on the desktop, preferring to fall back into my daydream of an earlier time 
filled with raised hands, muffled giggles, lessons yet to be learned and lives yet to be lived. And then came the question I could never keep at bay. Did Gideon ever sit in this classroom? Did he ever raise his hand to answer a question or write a hidden message that had not been erased? That was when it dawned on me. Where would a student write a secret message? I was thinking the words, but I must have said them out loud because Letty and Ruthann abandoned their own search and stood beside me as my drumming fingers went silently, went still. I lifted the desktop and laid it back on its hinges to reveal the space where each student would store his or her books and slate or tablet of paper, where one might keep a secret note or drawing passed from a friend or an admirer. The desk was empty except for an old pencil whittled down to a nub. There were no messages from admirers. No hidden notes had been passed behind the teacher's back. My, soul, my shoulders slumped like I had just flunked in a final exam. Then Liddy saw it. Look, she pointed at the underside of a desktop. There in a handwritten scrawl were the words... Here I sit, my eyelids sagging, while my teacher's tongue just won't quit wagging. Louver Thompson. Uncle Louver? Letty said, sounding shocked and proud. Well, I'll be dipped in sugar, Ruthann breathed. We all stared as if we had discovered some ancient Egyptian hieroglyphics. He graduated high school years before our, even our mother's. This must have been here over 20 years. I can't believe it's still here, I said. It's only in pencil. Somebody could have erased it years ago. What kid would want to erase fine poetry like that, Liddy smiled. You'd be considered the lucky one to have this desk. Let's see if there's any more that might have writing, I said, moving to the next desk over. Here's one. It's unsigned. My mind wanders, my attention drifts. Outside, it looks like heaven, till Mr. Epson calls on me and says, Do problems one through seven. Ruthann read another. I hear an explosion. What could it be? It's chemistry class with Miss Velma T. Frankie Santonio. Then suddenly Letty screamed from the desk in the far back corner. Here it is! Ode to the Rattler by Stucky Sabolsky. Ruthann and I hurled chairs to reach, hurtled chairs to reach the back. We looked at Letty in anticipation, but she said, Ruthann, I think you should get to read it. After all, it was your idea to look. Okay, Ruthann grinned and raised an eyebrow, but don't blame me if it's scary. Oh, to the rattler, she began, making her voice sound spooky like Count Dracula. He roams through the woods, prowling the night, rattling to wake the dead. The dogs sniff and bark, chasing this ghost, but only came back well fed. What is he up to? Where does he go? Is he a skeleton chattering alone? The rattler is watching. He knows who you are. Maybe he'll throw you a bone. Ruth Ann did such a fine rendition that we were pleasantly spooked until we heard a chattering noise in the hallway. After several seconds of us pointing to each other, determining who should look out the window of the door, it seemed that with, Lou Rett, with Letty and Ruth Ann both pointing to me, I was the chosen one. Without a word, Letty got down on her hands and knees next to the door, and I stepped up on her back. I saw a man in sweat-stained clothes, a cigar hung from his mouth. He dunked a large scrub brush into a bucket of water and commenced half-heartedly scrubbing the floor. Led Letty fidgeted a little under my weight. What do you see? She grunted. It's a janitor. The janitor, Ruthann, smacked her hand against her forehead. Oh, my Lord, you mean Mr. Foster? Yeah, he's scrubbing the hallway. And from the looks of the tin canister next to him, I think he's fixing to do some waxing. Oh, my gosh. Letty shifted again, and I bumped up against the door, 
the noise startled Mr. Foster, and he dropped his cigar right into the soapy water. He let fly a string of curses that would make a sailor blush, and stopped down the hallway and out of sight. He left, I said, jumping down from Letty's back. I think he's just going to get another cigarette. If we hurry, we can sneak back out the same way we came in. The three of us scampered out of the classroom and back to the open window. Ruth Ann and I gave Letty a boost up. Then I laced my fingers together to give Ruth Ann a foothold. She looked at me. Wait a minute. He's got the bucket. If you give me a leg up, how will you get out? I confessed I hadn't thought that far ahead. I'll find an open door. But hurry up or he'll come back and I'll be stuck in here. I'll be fine, I assured her. Okay, we'll meet you in the alley behind the schoolyard. She wiggled out of the window and was gone. I chanced to look into the hallway, but he wasn't there. But as soon as I ventured into the open, his swear words announced his return. The place, the closet, the closest place to go was back into the senior classroom. I ducked in and leaned my back against the chalkboard with my heart pounding and sweat trickling down my neck. By then, the shadows in the classroom had grown dark. My breathing seemed so loud, I was sure Mr. Foster could hear me through the classroom wall. It was the same feeling I had when getting ready to jump from a train, only this train wasn't slowing down. I could hear the sound of the janitor's lackadaisical scrubbing against the wooden floor. It looked like I might be stuck there for a while. As I slowly inched along the wall and away from the door, my hand brushed across the pages of a still-open dictionary. It was open to the H's. This was the only dictionary I'd seen since coming to Manifest, and I remember Sister Redemptus' instructions. Manifest, she said. Look it up. I thumbed through the pages. Hobble, hobby, hobnail. What's a hobnail? I wondered. I flipped ahead to Miss Magi, Maggie Pie, Mad Pie, Manicure, Manifest. I listened to make sure I could hear scrubbing in the hall. Mr. Foster was still at it. Manifest. Noun. A list of passengers on a ship. That was interesting, since most of the people who lived in Manifest years before were immigrants who had come to this country on ships, so their names would have been listed on a ship's manifest. But Sister Edempta had said that the word was a verb as well as a noun. Manifest. Verb. To reveal. To make known. I admit... I was stumped. She had said to start my story with the dictionary and this definition in particular. How was this supposed to help me start a story? What was I supposed to make known? The room was hot and stuffy. I lifted my foot to give my leg a scratch and managed to knock a book off the bottom shelf. It hit the floor with a thump. Quietly picking it up, all I heard was my own breathing. That was it. No scrubbing noise from the hallway. I scooted quickly back to the door, only to smell the stale odor of old cigar. Then somebody on the other side slowly turned the doorknob. I couldn't move, and there was no place to hide anyway. This was just an empty summertime classroom. I squeezed the book to my chest, waiting to be discovered when there was a loud kapow, kapang, kapow, kapow, farther down the hallway. It sounded like Al Capone had arrived when manifest with Tommy guns blazing.